now is to uh, yeah, is to talk about what Brighten the Chain means. Uh, that was the title of our uh, initial event of the series. And I thought it was very important because, um, because uh, as I mentioned last time, this is not a public relations campaign of Dhyana Bhaga Nation. This series is put on by uh, people of the greater Syracuse community um, who are very concerned about our future and about our past relationships with not only the Onondaga and the Haudenosaunee, but indigenous people in general. Um, this is a picture of the Gaswenta, or two-row wampum. Many of you already know this, but I thought I would mention it because for me, this wampum is a kind of an operating manual, you know, how I go about doing my work. But it's also how I think Noon understands doing their work in the community. Um, uh, the representation is of two purple strands running down uh, the river of life. The Haudenosaunee in their vessel, their canoe, and European Americans, non Haudenosaunee, in their vessel, vessel or ship, uh, going parallel to one another into the future. Same same river of life, two different vessels. But in, in between those two streams are three strands of white beads, representative of peace, friendship, and respect. And what this, this series is about is to uh, brighten that chain of friendship, of peace, and respect. And it is to put into right balance the relationships between indigenous and non-indigenous people in this area. So um, I thought that was a pretty important statement about how the series hopes to uh, bring back into balance appropriate relationships. So um, what we're talking about today is the doctrine of discovery, which is where the rela relationships got out of balance. Um, I attribute this to to Warren Lyons, but recently I heard James Cameron talk about, you know, the director of Avatar say something very similar on television. He said, um, you know, the environment really has no problems. There's no problem with the environment. The environment will be fine, probably without us, but it'll be fine. It'll come back into balance in some form or fashion. But, so the real problem uh, with the environment is us and our not having an appropriate, proper relationship to the natural world. Um, so, uh, many of the ideas that we hope to foster in the series are to bring some of that, um, uh, some of those indigenous values back into um, our own community. Uh, in indigenous values like, for example, you can't, uh, we're all for economic development, but you can't make an enemy of the natural world in developing the economy. You know, simple, obvious feature of our future. Um, or like, um, everyone has a responsibility and a duty to participate in this is our society, our culture, a kind of radical democratic principle. Um, also, we have to listen to women. Uh, it's a good idea. But probably if we listened to women more often, we wouldn't be as quick to run into crazy wars around the, around the world and that sort of thing. So there's, some, there's a lot of values we could be discussing that would um, uh, would help us out, will help us out into the future, and the Onondaga Nation is a tremendous, uh, of, an, of tremendous value for this community because the way in which they've maintained those values, which we talked about last time. All right, in December of 2009, a delegation of Haudenosaunee
Company, led by Orrin Lyons and Jake Swamp, uh, went to Melbourne, Australia, Melbourne, as they say, Melbourne, Australia, uh, for the Parliament of World, World Religions. Um, and there, there were a number of different indigenous people gathered uh, to discuss issues of world importance. The theme of the gathering was make a world of difference, healing each other, healing the earth. These are some of the major topics of the parliament. Notice the first two, healing the earth with care and concern and reconciling with indigenous peoples. The Parliament of World Religions started in 1892 as part of the Columbus uh, 400 year celebration at that time. And um, at that time, uh, the West really found, uh, was introduced to things like Hinduism and Buddhism, Shinto, uh, in a popular way. But indigenous people were basically kept in cages as an amusement along the midway. This was in Chicago, Illinois. So now in 2009, several years after the first parliament, they made a, a real strenuous effort to attract indigenous people to be a, a part of the parliament. Uh, to have a dialogue with them. And at the parliament, a caucus of indigenous people put together a statement, part of which said, this is long, unfortunately, but unfortunately certain doctrines have been threatening to the survival of our cultures, our languages, and our peoples, and devastating to our ways of life. These are found in particularly, particular colonizing documents such as the Interparable Papal Bull of 1493. Papal Bull is simply a, a letter from the Pope to the Church, which called for the subjugation of non-Christian nations and peoples and the propagation of the Christian Empire. This is the root of the doctrine of Christian discovery that is still interwoven into laws and policies today that must be changed. The principles of subjugation contained in this and other such documents and in the religious texts and documents of other religions have been and continue to be destructive to our ways of life, religions, cultures, and the survival of our indigenous nations and people. This oppressive tradition is what led to the boarding schools, the residential schools, and the stolen generation, resulting in the trauma of indigenous peoples being cut off from their languages and cultures, resulting in language death and loss of family integrity from the actions of churches and governments. We call on those churches and governments to put as much time, effort, energy, and money into assisting with the re revitalization of our languages and cultures as they put into attempting to destroy them. All right. So what is this doctrine of Christian discovery? Um, you'll recognize this. Columbus, from Columbus Circle downtown, um, Columbus sitting atop this embodied Indian head. Um, uh, I've been teaching on the, uh, doing research and teaching on the area of religion and, and colonialism for, um, since the mid, early to mid 80s, and teaching about this topic since 1990, but it wasn't until 2005 when I went to a panel organized by Tanya Ganella Kushner of the UN, a panel that featured Warren Lyons and Stephen Newhoop, um, that uh, I was introduced to this concept of this doctrine of Christian discovery, which galvanized a lot of these issues of religion and colonialism. So at least 
why we're dealing with it in this series. Um, if, um, if you were to, to come up with a, uh, an idea, a cultural, uh, cultural idea that would be completely antithetical to indigenous values, it would have to be the doctrine of discovery. So, so these are at odds with one another. And uh, so tonight, we're going into the, the unifying problem that we're facing today. In 1452, Pope Nicholas V authorizes King Alfonso V of Portugal to invade, capture, vanquish, and subdue all Saracens and pagans to reduce their persons to perpetual slavery and to take away all their possessions and property. So um, Christianity was then utilized to justify the when a Christian encounters a non-Christian to take everything that they have, including their own person. In 
2008, the Haudenosaunee issued this statement, read by Oren Lyons. It turns out that the principles of the doctrine of discovery remain foundational and determinative in US federal law and the law of many other settler states around the world. The law of Christendom, which prevailed during the discovery periods of the 16th, 17th, 15th, 16th, and 17th century, continues on into today. The divine right of kings and popes were the engines of empire. The papal bulls of 1493-94, coupled with the first letters of patent issued by King Henry VII to John Cabot and Sons, March 5, 1496, established the process of colonization of the Western Hemisphere. This is uh, an image of John Cabot's landing on the shores of Labrador, and um, it was sanctioned, as I just said, by Henry VIII, who gave John Cabot, uh, uh, authorizing him to, quote, seek out, discover, and find whatsoever isles, countries, and regions of the heathens and infidels that before this time had been unknown to all Christian people. So in other words, the, the English were interested in getting in on the action, the discovery action, of the Portuguese and the Spanish that were already well underway. Now, okay, uh, this we'll talk much more about, I hope, but in July 2009, the U.S. Episcopal Church, and remember, it's, it's the, the, the English Church, voted unanimously to adopt a resolution to repudiate the doctrine of discovery. And that was done through the efforts of John Diefenbacher Kroll. So we'll hear more, much more about that later. Advocated the U that the U.S. adopt the U.N. Declaration of the Rights of Indigenous People and was particularly uh, interested in repudiating the Cabot Charter. The Episcopalians, uh, my reading is the Episcopalians felt that the doctrine of Christian discovery and colonialism was corrosive to their own tradition. And I think this is an important point, that Christian groups, like the Unitarians, the Friends, other grassroots Catholic organizations that are taking on this issue, are doing so not just because it's the right thing to do, put, put proper relationships back into balance between their community and indigenous people, but also because the doctrine of Christian discovery is corrosive for their own tradition. That, that, it, that they, in a way, um, to look, take this self-examination is useful for the survival of their own denomination. All right, now I wanted to just briefly put a, put a personal face on the doctrine of Christian discovery. And this has to do with boarding schools. It's not something we're gonna deal with directly in the series, but it's, a, it's an issue of enormous importance for native people all over uh, the United States, Canada, Australia, and other places. This is an exhibit called Much Whole Remember by the artist Gary Miller um, that was curated by Neil Keating, and I've got his email there if you're interested, um, at the Woodland Cultural Center Six Nations uh, territory. Um, this is recounting his experience in the Mohawk Institute at Six Nations. And it's a very powerful exhibit. I hope to bring this art show here so that we can see and meet this artist. This is the poster of the opening, which was two years ago. It says here, the exhibit, uh, this exhibition of works by Gary Miller, Mohawk artist, is a testament to his life while at the Mohawk Institute from 1953 to 64. The suffering and hardships he experienced while there left deep wounds, scars, and horrid memories, memories that have taken him to every level of self-destruction that one can imagine. His ability to bring these images to life and allow others to witness his life has been a part of his healing. You can witness the healing with the adjacent exhibition of his work. The art of healing, which consists of distinctive landscapes, showcasing nature's beauty, transforming the ugliness of a child's memory of his residential school life to a peaceful and serene place. Warning, not suitable for all audiences. Um, the, the Mohawk Institute was, was administered by the Anglican Church, 
function with the Canadian government, and in that way represents a lot of the different uh, boarding school activity in the U.S. as well. So this is just the warning um, before one got into the museum. The, ex ex uh, the exhibit is divided up into an introduction, evocation, genocide, surviving. Introduction. This section introduces the artist as a whole person, fully conscious of what happened to him when he was a child and of the connection between violence and colonization. This is a self-portrait of him as a, as a youth. Another self-portrait. This section evokes memory through a large mural that reads from right to left and also through a video kiosk which loops a 37 minute video. It's a documentary about the artist and his exhibit filmed by the curator. He came as a very small child and he's surrounded by prying eyes. He's trying to hide. This is an image to show you were there of the scratching underneath desks where children would hide to get away from the priests. This is a large mural that goes over several different walls called the Dismembery, Dismembered Memory Wampum Belt. It consists of 12 separate paintings that are strung together in a sequence. So it demonstrates how the the boarding school fractured his memory as a, na as a native person. Genocide. This section takes the viewer further into Miller's memory into the nighttime of extreme loneliness, fear, loathing, and sexual predation that constituted the lived environment of the mush hole. These are expressions from the inside of the artist's mind, both verbal and Reverend Zimmerman was the leader of this particular boarding school, and by Gary Miller's account, was an extremely violent man and also raped the young girl children. And this is what the church means to Gary Miller it means erasure. Surviving. This section includes portraits and landscapes by Miller that demonstrate his survival, adaptation as an artist. As such, the inclusion of different works in this section may change during the course of the tour. It includes chairs, sweet grass, and sage for smudging, along with matches and tray tissues, lots of contact info for crisis lines. So, kind of a safe space at the end. Now, you know, the story of boarding schools is uh, one common for literally thousands, if not tens of, tens of thousands of Native people all around the world. And even in our family, my wife, Sandy Bigtree, her, her uh, grandfather was a resident of Thomas Boarding School. And I don't think you can really overestimate the destructive from our point of view, of the boarding school experience. Because the boarding school literally took everything from these young children. It took their language, their clan. It took everything 
session. And thank you, Phil and John and Mary McDonald, who I had the privilege of uh, sharing a great lunch with in Melbourne, Australia, uh, when we were there together at that World Parliament uh, on the World Religion. Well, my uh, responsibility this evening is to uh, look at a couple of things, and that is the doctrine of discovery as well as the Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. And I'm going to also talk about a study, the preliminary study on the doctrine of discovery. But I'm also going to address something that Phil had mentioned to me um, earlier in preparing for this evening. And that was, he said something to me in terms of how urgent this issue is, this particular issue, the doctrine of discovery. He said that this is an important issue for everyone. And it's, a, and it's an issue for our time. And, and I thought about it, and I thought, you know, he's absolutely right. And how would I answer this? Well, I, I thought about it, and I said, well, <coughs> I would answer it probably in this way. I'd answer it because racism is not sustainable. Racism in institutions, racism in our lives is just not sustainable on any level. And let me share with you what I mean by that. What we are exhibiting on a daily level is how the institutions that um, everyone in this country has thought would last forever and thought they could count on. And they are disintegrating and melting away one right after another. And this veneer <coughs> that sort of covered the eyes of the middle class, the working class, the poor, um, that sort of made everything look rosy and okay, has shattered. And now everyone is looking, just about everyone is looking and questioning these multilateral institutions and saying, what is going on? The foundation is cracking and they're asking questions. And they're asking questions about basic Things. Not just about the institutions themselves, but basic questions about necessities. Necessities that have to do with their families. How am I going to take care of my loved ones? And I, if you would bear with me, I listed a few of those necessities questions about how do I gain access to food security, water security, <coughs> energy security, housing security, and job security. And I just listed five. There are a bunch of others that I think you off the top of your head would, would list. And then I looked at them. And I thought, well, 10, 20 years ago, you could ask someone about job security, and they would say, yes, there's such a thing as job security. But if you ask someone now if there was job security or such a thing in this country, they would say, more than likely, no. Right? Checked off that one. 10 or 20 years ago, you could ask someone, is there housing security? Shelter. Someone would probably say, more than likely, yes, shelter, housing for my loved ones, yes, there's security there. Now if you ask someone that same question, they would say, no. Check off that one. 
Then I looked in energy security. Well, if you went back to 1973, pretty much the whole country would say, no, there's no such thing as energy security. So checked off three. Well, now there's only two left, water security and food security. And my dear friends and relatives, with only two left, I think we need to seriously look at those two basic securities and necessities that are going to be biting at our ankles very soon and very quickly. And how are we going to address them? And how are we going to deal with them? Now there is a method to my madness, right? If, if you um, been to other discussions with Onondaga people, you know that we, we get there, we get to the point eventually. And I wanted to make the point that what we as indigenous peoples and with our neighbors are doing is cross-cultural work, interfaith work, and working with each other to question all these institutions as neighbors, as relatives, as friends. Questioning these multilateral institutions who are crumbling before our eyes. Institutions that are based on legal constructs, legal constructs based on racism. Federal Indian law, which Phil shared with us a few minutes ago, Johnson versus McIntosh in 1823, that began the basis of federal Indian law, and which most of you know is a huge, huge body of law just for Native people, for the obvious reason that we are the only people in this country that hold on to land sources still. So there's a whole body of federal law and New York state law that deal with just Indians for that reason. On concepts based on racism that are influencing all of us, not just the Onondaga Nation. So there is a need and most of you in this room understand that, that we have these conversations because it's affecting, it's affecting all of us. And asking the question, how does, how, how, how does a government, a governmental institution, take such an arrogant position that racism is transferred into law, that it does become law, whether it's 200 years ago or 500 years ago, and how did that happen? And I, I'd like to ask you a couple of questions and see if you agree with me or not. Right. So you better say yes. Indigenous peoples, human beings. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, very good. Okay. Okay. Was the Western Hemisphere teeming with people in 1492? Yes. Very good. So it was not empty. No. Okay. All right. Good. The only no. And number three. Did Indigenous have their own government in place with their own constitution, own body of laws, and were sovereign entities upon the arrival of the European people. Yes. yes. So we can conclude then, all right, therefore, that indigenous peoples 
held ownership over their land, resources, and territory? Yes or no? Yes. <laughs> so we had jurisdiction over our land, resources, and territory. However, what we looked at and what we're <coughs> looking at and what Phil showed us is that the doctrine of discovery that arrived in this hemisphere said that indigenous peoples were the lawful spoil and prey of the civilized conqueror, the European. That we were even pagan, Saracens, infidels, barbarians, savages, all of those nice titles. And we had the right to occupy, but we didn't have the right to ownership. So if we were classified as heathen, Saracens, pagan, savages, barbarians, then we were not human beings. All right, so your question to your answer to question number one was wrong. Indigenous peoples were not human beings according to this doctrine of discovery. So if indigenous peoples are not human beings, they're such a legal construct known as terra nullis from way back when that basically said if a land is empty of Christians, of unbaptized human beings, then the land is empty and therefore open for the taking. As long as it hasn't been taken over by another European Christian nation. All right? They always respected one another's discoveries. If there was a conflict, then the Pope would be the arbiter between those two conflicting nations. He would make the decision. Right? So your answers were all wrong. <laughs> Even though you got it. According to this legal construct, the doctrine of discovery. Now this is the thinking that arrived on our shore, on our shores. This institutional thinking based on racism. So the question is, how do you build a civilization? How do you build a country? How do you build a people and institute based on something that begins with racism, that begins in such a negative way? that is going to last throughout time and not chatter and not have cracks and not come apart and not be fair to everybody who's, who's in there, who's part of it. And my answer would be an obvious, an obvious, you can't. It just isn't working. It may take 200 years, 100 years, but it's crafty. The veneer has cracked, dear friends. And what indigenous peoples have decided to do is address it. Address it head on. And we decided to do that when someone named Steve Newcomb came to an elder circle meeting in 1992, and I think you've heard this story, with some research about this doctrine of discovery, about the Johnson versus McIntosh case, and how it was based on these racist concepts. And it has been building momentum since then. 
and many of us have been looking at the instruments, at the cases, and what we have been found, finding has been astonishing. And let me share with you some of the things that are just so obvious. First of all, the information is not hidden. It's right under our big noses. It's there. The scholars know it. They all know it. You have to dig a little bit, but it's there. <coughs> it kind of begs the question, if it's there, why don't we know about it? Kind of like the same thing um, when you talk about Native history in the United States. Why doesn't anybody know about American Indians in the school system? Why don't they think there are no American Indians east of the Mississippi? Right? It's there, but when you teach an indigenous peoples class, a history class, a law class, you have to start from the beginning because your students know absolutely nothing, absolutely nothing about Native people here in this country. But the information is there. And the scholars and the elite have this information and know about it. So now what we have to do is get the information out to everyone and out to our friends, to the public, to everyone to do, start doing their own research. Now, the Permanent Forum on Indigenous Issues, which I have the privilege of being the North American representative. So my region involves the United States and Canada. Last year, at the eighth session, a resolution was passed that I would begin a preliminary study on the effect that the doctrine of discovery had on indigenous peoples worldwide and the human rights violations that it may have had or did have on indigenous peoples. As Phil said, I submitted that document a couple of weeks ago. It is now a UN official document and you can get it. You can download it at, if you just punch in indigenous peoples, permanent forum on indigenous issues, go to um, a recent documents of the secretariat and you will find the document it's not that huge. And what we did when we wrote that document was we included a great deal of research so that those of you who <coughs> want to begin your own research have a bibliography and have a huge amount of footnotes to start your own work. So you can go off on your own tangents so you don't have to start from I last addressed the Syracuse audience on May 19, 1988, when I spoke to the Central New York Environmental Organization at its annual awards dinner. Somehow, I find it hard to believe that 22 years have passed since that public speaking engagement. Am I really that old? <laughs> Only a few years before that, I was attending Colgate University in Hamilton, New York, not very far from here, focusing on graduating and a young woman from the class of 1985. <laughs> Despite spending four years in Hamilton at a liberal arts college generally rated among the finest in the nation, my education was woefully incomplete. I learned little about the Haudenosaunee and their rich history and what we today call New York State. Most of my knowledge of Indians came from James Fenimore Cooper's Leatherstocking tale. And though I remain an admirer of Cooper's novels, the Native Americans in this audience know Cooper's tales don't represent their history. Even 
more regrettably, I never heard a mention of the doctrine of discovery during my undergraduate education. And alarmingly, I believe that my ignorance of the doctrine of discovery until a few years ago mirrors the experience of most Americans. In a country that prides itself on insulating the government from the establishment of any particular form of religious belief, most Americans do not know that a religious idea first espoused by Roman Catholic popes approximately 600 years ago served as the foundation of international law justifying the European invasion around the world and persists as the intellectual underpinning of federal Indian law. Do we accept the idea that a particular religious belief justifies the taking of indigenous land and renders the indigenous inhabitants mere occupants, subject to the control of the discoverers? Well, thank goodness Tanya already asked me that question, and I'm really elated that this audience says no. Um, but unfortunately, that's not what U.S. law says. That's not what international law says in too many instances. We've heard about the Johnson versus McIntosh decision. But listen to the shocking ideas and racism expressed in this 1823 U.S. Supreme Court decision. just want to read part of this. And as Tanya and Philip know, this is written by Chief Justice John Marshall, one of the most famous Supreme Court justices in history. On the discovery of this immense continent, the great nations of Europe were eager to appropriate to themselves so much of it as they could respectively acquire. Its vast extent offered an ample field to the ambition and enterprise of all, and the character and religion of its inhabitants offered an apology for considering them as a people over whom the superior genius of Europe might claim an ascendancy. The potentates of the old world found no difficulty in convincing themselves that they made ample compensation to the inhabitants of the new by bestowing on them civilization and Christianity in exchange for unlimited independence. But as they were all in pursuit of nearly the same object, it was necessary in order to avoid conflicting settlements and consequent war with each other to establish a principle which all should acknowledge as the law by which the right of acquisition, which they all asserted, should be regulated as between themselves. This principle was that discovery gave title to the government by whose subjects or by whose authority it was made against all other European governments, which title might be consummated by possession. The Supreme Court found the United States received title to the land within the country's boundaries based on Great Britain's original assertion of the right of discovery. How does an individual respond to such injustice? I decided to begin within the church because the ideas central to the doctrine of discovery originated with Christian religious leaders. For me, my faith has a direct culpability for the development and transmission of this evil idea. I approached my rector at St. James Episcopal Church in Old Town, Maine, to preach about this subject. On October 15, 2006, I challenged my church, the Diocese of Maine, the Episcopal Church, and the Anglican Communion to renounce the 1496 Royal Charter of the Church of England to John Cabot and his sons. Phil Arnold put it up earlier, and so I will, won't read it to you again. But I cited that specific document because it was issued by King Henry VII, the English monarch. And though the Anglican Church had not yet separated from the Roman Catholic Church at that time, a close relationship existed between what was to become Anglicanism and the royal crown. Indigenous leaders, two months prior to my October 2006 sermon, had called on the Queen of England and the Archbishop of Canterbury to renounce the Cabot Charter. I also wanted to emphasize that all branches of Christianity have complicity in upholding the doctrine of discovery. A person could easily 
publicly condemn the Roman Catholic Church for the papal bull espousing a right of conquest based on current Christian superiority, when the true object of our moral outrage should center on the doctrine of discovery in all of its manifestations. As Jesus says in Matthew, do not judge so that you may not be judged. For how can we say to our neighbor, let me take the speck out of your eye while the log is in your own eye? Following my sermon at St. James, I approached the Episcopal Committee on Indian Relations in the winter of 2006-2007 to introduce a resolution at diocesan convention to repudiate the doctrine of discovery and the Cabot Charter. The Committee on Indian Relations originated in 1992 as our diocese reflected on how we should respond to Columbus's 500th anniversary of the, quote, discovery of the Western Hemisphere. I received enthusiastic support from my fellow committee members, and I proceeded to draft the resolution on behalf of the committee. As I wrote the resolution language, I contacted Steve Newcomb, one of the foremost scholars on the doctrine of discovery, an Indian Country Today columnist, and author of Pagans in the Promised Land, Decoding the Doctrine of Christian Discovery. I recommend Mr. Newcomb's book to everyone here who wants to read an in-depth exploration of the doctrine of discovery. His 1992 essay, 500 Years of Injustice, The Legacy of 15th Century Religious Prejudice, inspired my October 2006 sermon delivered at St. James. Steve gladly agreed to review drafts of our diocesan resolution to ensure the accuracy of the language and to frame it in a manner to have the maximum benefit to him and the many others who have been working to expose and to expunge the doctrine of discovery from the world. I want to make clear to this audience that I have relied on the indigenous scholarship of Steve Newcomb and others in my effort to contribute to a political movement to purge the doctrine of discovery from the world. These ideas or insights did not originate with me. The resolution, the diocesan resolution number two, considered at the 188th convention of our diocese, states in part that the Diocese of Maine calls upon the Archbishop of Canterbury for the Church of England and the Supreme Governor of the Church of England, the Queen of England, to disavow and rescind the claimed validity of the doctrine of discovery against all peoples, specifically as it is set forth in the 1496 English Royal Charter granted to John Cabot and his son. I was a delegate to the diocesan convention, purposely running to represent my church to allow me to advocate for resolution number two. On Friday, October 26, 2007, the lay and clergy delegates gathered past resolution number two. Diocese of Maine calls upon the Archbishop of Canterbury and the Queen of England to revoke the 1496 Royal Charter issued to John Cabot and his sons by a vote of 175 to 135. objective of my October 15, 2006 sermon had been fulfilled. I knew achieving the third, having the Episcopal Church go on record, repudiating the doctrine of discovery would be much harder. My extensive community organizing background helped me formulate a plan to ensure success at the Episcopal Church's general convention scheduled for July 2009. I concluded that the prospect of passing a resolution denouncing the doctrine of discovery would increase if I persuaded other Episcopal dioceses to emulate what Maine had done. The first place I focused on was the Episcopal Diocese of Central New York, which includes Syracuse. I chose the Diocese of Central New York because of the many family members who were active parishioners and churches from the northern tip of the diocese in Barneville to the southern border in Endicott. I believe that my brother-in-law, Bill Diefenbacher, suggested I contact John, Professor John Chafee. Professor Chafee teaches at the State University of New York at Binghamton and has extensive knowledge of Episcopal Church procedures, 
having served as a delegate to the 2006 General Convention. This knowledge proved invaluable as I was not well acquainted with national church procedures. I believe that my first contact with John Chafee occurred in the late winter of 2008. I explained to him what we had done in Maine, and I shared with him my plan to enlist other dioceses to pass resolutions similar to resolution number two, with the intention of building support for passage of an anti-Doctrine of Discovery resolution at General Convention in 2009. John Chafee expressed interest into my plan and agreed to help. He also urged me to contact the Reverend Jennifer Baskerville Burroughs, who is rector at Grace Church right here in Syracuse. John Chafee and Reverend Baskerville Burroughs worked together to submit a resolution for consideration at the November 2008 Central Diocese of New York Convention based on the resolution number two enacted in Maine. The resolution passed. With two Episcopal dioceses on record denouncing the Doctrine of Discovery, I began working the winter of 2009 to write a resolution for consideration at General Convention. In the Episcopal Church, we hold a General Convention comprising lay and ordained delegates every three years. One component of the General Convention consists of the consideration of resolutions. Again, I work closely with Steve Newcomb along with the co-chairs of the main committee on Indian relations, John Chafee, Reverend Baskerville Burroughs, to craft resolution language for the general convention. I did this drafting well aware that once the resolution was submitted, the, the delegates at general convention had complete control over the final language. Most fortunately, John Chafee was elected as one of the delegates to represent the Diocese of Central New York and he was assigned to serve on the key committee that considers resolutions at General Convention. Once the resolution language was submitted in May 2009, I began working with the Committee on Indian Relations to secure the strong support of our diocesan delegates and Bishop Stephen Lane, our diocesan bishop, for the anti-Doctrine of Discovery resolution. Bishop Lane assigned one of our diocesan lay delegates, Brenda Hamilton, to shepherd the resolution's passage at General Convention. Though I had never met Brenda Hamilton in person before, we quickly established a tight working relationship. She, similarly to John Chafee, possessed far more knowledge of national church procedures and players compared to my limited familiarity. Brenda Hamilton became my eyes and ears at General Convention, serving a critical communications and advocacy role that allowed me to remain effectively connected with what was happening in Anaheim, California, the site of the convention, without my actual physical presence. While the anti-doctrine of discovery resolution was considered in committee, the Bishop Mark McDonald of the Anglican Church in Canada suggested language be added calling on the U.S. to endorse the Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. Bishop McDonald's suggestion was incorporated. Resolution D-035 emerged from committee with four principal provisions. One, the General Convention repudiates the doctrine of discovery as fundamentally opposed to the gospel of Jesus Christ. And I think Phil Arnold said well that though we do this, called as Christians, and I do this, because I believe a tremendous injustice has been done that we need to atone for and to make right. But look at that resolution language. We find that this violates the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's why we as Christians belong. That's what Christians we are called to do. And so this is fundamental about our faith. Two, that the Episcopal Church review its policies in light of enacting Resolution D-035 and write to Queen Elizabeth II requesting Her Majesty disavow and repudiate the Doctrine of Discovery. Three, that each diocese within the Episcopal Church seek a greater understanding of its neighboring indigenous peoples and support them in their ongoing efforts to secure inherent sovereignty and fundamental human rights as peoples. Finally, Resolution D-035 directs the Church's Office of Government Relations to 
advocate for U.S. endorsement of the Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. Resolution D-035 passed by a wide margin in the House of Delegates, and the House of Bishops unanimously endorsed it. So Resolution D-035 has energized the worldwide anti-doctrine of discovery movement. Elizabeth Koopman, inspired by the Episcopal Church's action, worked to have the Philadelphia Yearly Meeting Indian Committee in September 2009 adopt a minute concerning the doctrine of discovery and the Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. My co-panelists this evening, Tanya and Phil, um, as members of the Indigenous delegation to the Parliament of World Religions, as you saw Phil put up earlier, their statement was in part um, informed by Resolution D-035. Um, and we actually wrote a letter of support um, from the Committee on Indian Relations that supported that statement. Less than six weeks ago, Daniel Callahan took the first step in having Unitarian Universalists adopt a statement of conscience when the Tarpon Springs, Florida church where he worshiped approved his anti-doctrine of discovery statement at the church's annual meeting. Along with the Episcopal Church, the Quakers and Unitarian Universalists have joined this burgeoning movement for indigenous justice. A people who agree the doctrine of discovery contradicts the gospel of Jesus Christ and any defensible code of justice may ask, what can I do to help purge the world of this abhorrent doctrine? Now, Tanya gave us some excellent suggestions, and I completely back them. I have some more to make to you. Um, I suggest you start by reflecting on your role and association. Many of us here tonight are parents. You could ask, what do the schools my children attend teach about the doctrine of discovery? More generally, what do New York schools teach about the Haudenosaunee and the other indigenous peoples who reside in the Empire State? In Maine, People focused on tribal state relations recognize the harm caused by the non-Indian population's ignorance of the Wabanaki, the umbrella term for the indigenous people who reside in what we today call Maine. The Maine Indian Tribal State Commission played a major role in having the Maine legislature enact a law in 2001 requiring Maine public schools to teach about the Wabanaki in grades K through 12. In fact, Wabanaki Studies comprises the only mandated curriculum in the state of Maine. If such a law does not exist in New York State, people might consider initiating a campaign to enact such a requirement. For the educators in the audience, especially those who teach New York or U.S. history or social studies, you could consider the question, what am I teaching about the doctrine of discovery? Federal Indian law and the indigenous peoples of this continent. I contend any review of major U.S. Supreme Court cases in your classrooms should include Johnson v. McIntosh, right along with other seminal cases such as Plessy v. Ferguson and Brown v. Topeka, Kansas. Information and critical thinking about these topics should be infused throughout the curriculum, not ghettoized to a shallow unit about Indians and pilgrims at Thanksgiving. Would we teach math or reading a few days a year? Students might consider taking a Native Studies course. If none are offered at your school, propose an independent study. Outside the classroom, students might investigate the existence of any Native student organization and explore the roles within them for non-Indian allies. Students can also press the school's administration to expand course offerings on these topics and to invite more indigenous people to speak about the doctrine of discovery and related topics on campus. Beyond an academic setting, students can explore an internship working with a tribal government, religious organizations such as the American Friends Service Committee Indian Program, Tanya Krishner's group, the American Indian Law Alliance, or a local nonprofits such as Neighbors of the Onondaga Nation. Aspects of the doctrine of discovery, ramifications of federal Indian law, and issues related to tribal sovereignty appear in your media sources 
all the time. I read them online. Consider critically what you read, hear, or view, and take the time to reflect on the indigenous viewpoint, along with the dominant society's depiction of the issue. I presume most, if not all, of the individuals gathered here are U.S. citizens, and a number of you may also vote in New York State. Perhaps the most important thing you can do is demand that your state and federal elected officials respect tribal sovereignty, adhere to all treaties and agreements with indigenous peoples, and promote public policies mutually beneficial to indigenous and non-indigenous governments. During the turbulent political period leading up to the enactment of the Maine Indian Claims Settlement Act in 1980, some Maine politicians advanced their political careers as Indian fighters, fomenting an anti-Wabanaki public backlash in Maine. I know some New York State local, state, and federal elected officials employed the same approach to gain favor with certain segments of the electorate at Indian expense. The only way to stop this most vile of political pandering by politicians rests with New York State voters. Every time you learn of someone who represents you at any level of government, demonizes indigenous people, please let that elected official know she, he doesn't represent you. Too often bashing Indians benefits political careers. To stop this ugly politics, elected officials who resort to such despicable tactics must suffer defeat.